Hey guys, Mac here. This is the one where we both reveal how bad our snobbery is, especially because we don't use dedicated cigar cutting tools to enjoy our cigars. Uh, so you're probably gonna learn something today, and if you don't, that means you know something we don't, so you're gonna have to share in the comments what it is that we don't know. Cheers guys, enjoy. Alright, episode six. We're here. Episode it's six? Yeah, it's episode six, and I'm still smoking the same cigar from last week. How? I'm, I'm sitting in the exact same place as I was last week, and I have same clothes, same temperature outside, same setting. So I'm also pretty surprised that um, that we got the same same uh, setup it, for this week. What a coincidence. The thing is, when we finished the podcast last time, uh, I thought Matt Booth deserves better. So... Uh, I'll smoke this one halfway and finish the other half the next episode like that Davidoff guy. Not the Davidoff yeah, guy. Yeah, just like the Davidoff. Exactly. Just like your family and those who surround you uh, immediately deserve better. So after this episode, please go take a shower that you haven't showered in a week. So that's... Neither have you. So <laughs> come back to the podcast. And you haven't cut that cigar. No, because um, we're going to talk about cutting cigars. And I'm going to use a technique that I use pretty much every single time I cut a cigar. And, and you're going to hear about other people in the industry cutting the cigar this way. It's uh, very unique. You hear Carlito talking about you know, you hear people, aficionados and people in uh, different blogs and Instagram, social media, Facebook groups, whatever, talking about how using a bic is a crime or how biting your cigar is just a horrendous act. Um, but then you'll have that little excerpt from Cigar Aficionado with Pete Johnson and Carlito, um, like that five question segment that Scott Aficionado has done over the years. And then you'll have Carlito answer, you know, Hey, how do you cut or light a cigar? He's like, Oh, whatever I have closest to me, usually my nail or usually a bic, or I'll bite it off. And we're like, Oh, if the cigar God himself could do it, it's not that much of a crime. Right. Huh? So I'm going to cut this uh, chinchale. What? Who said it was a crime in the first place? The filthy guys. The filthy casual, exactly. <laughs> or those guys who uh, who who hopped on on the on the podcast and tell us that we don't know how to light cigars. Which they're so, right. Uh, yeah, that's that's why we are talking about cutting, not not lighting. Um, I'm going to use my nail. Um, is is what I usually use. I nine out of ten times get the perfect cut. Um, every now and then I'll, I'll, I'll take a little bit too much and I'll just quickly fix it. But as you can see, that's pretty nice. So you can't do that on a really brittle cigar. I do it in every single cigar, man. It doesn't, doesn't matter. I'll, I'll figure out a way. And sometimes I'll, I won't get like the perfect cut. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll grab a little match and I'll stick it in there just to get that extra, um, extra, you know, extra pop up in there for a better for a better draw um that's that's usually when i get a little you know brittle dry cigar i'll, I'll pop a little match in there take it out and it's going to be the perfect perfect cut but you know people don't want to hear that so i'm just going to transition from my nail to other other mechanisms and ways to cut your cigar and i'm going to let you take over and i'll just kind of feed off that how does that sound yeah. i'll take care of that i think uh I think that how you cut your cigar is an expression of personality. You know, I cut with a knife because I have a knife on me all the time. It's very yep. useful for a lot of things, not just cutting cigars, even though sometimes I go uh, all day and the only thing I cut was a cigar. But that's not the point. The point is that I can use this for multiple things while a cutter is just useless if I'm not going to go smoke a cigar. So I actually only own one cutter. It's a, two cutters, actually. A Zycar guillotine and a V-cut that was gifted to me that I've never used. And 
I have I actually like the V cut, but I just don't bother with carrying a V cutter. I actually like the guillotine, but I don't bother with carrying a guillotine. These are very valid methods of cutting your cigars and then enjoying them. Not the punch, though. I, I, I'm not a fan of the punch. I think the constricted draw takes away from the experience. Uh, yeah. Then if you have to poke it multiple times, well, the, what's the freaking point? Uh, they are convenient to carry. They're very portable. But at the end of the day, it, it's really cool. Uh, for those of you who are gun guys, you can actually uh, take a, uh, a brass casing and, yep. and use that. It's really cool. It looks badass, but at the same it time, does. what are you doing? Just ask anyone who meets you in the street. What are you doing with an empty casing in your pocket? Uh, and, and then it's just a whole <laughs> oh, cigars with it. Yeah, right. You do, buddy. So, you know, <laughs> what are you doing with your knife in your pocket? Well, cut things. That's an easy answer. So sometimes you can't carry a knife. When, when, I, when I'm not killing people and stabbing people, I'm, I'm cutting my cigar. <laughs> Right. Or you could just say something ridiculous like, uh, yeah, I was just shooting in my backyard and uh, I got to keep the case to refill, uh, you know, to reload my rounds. And they'll ask you, you're reloading a single round? <laughs> I just need one bullet. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'll admit they are cool, but. The punch is not my favorite just because of the restricted airflow. But the, the V cut, I think, actually performs the best. Yeah. For some reason, uh, actually, I think it does have more surface area if you get the right proportions. Because if you use a, a narrow, and correct, an, an acute V cutter on a wide cigar, that's correct. another reason I'm not a fan of carrying a cutter. Let's say, well, I bring my V cut, but I went to the walk in humidor and the cigar I really liked was an inch thick. It's uh, an Epicarillo inch, one inch. Mark. Well, guess what? My little itsy bitsy uh, V cutter isn't going to be that good on that. So I need the it's, right. It's just, it's just not going to cut it. <laughs> it's it's not going to cut it. <laughs> oh. Hey, um, let's, let's, let's talk about how you feel when you cut a cigar, right? Because you know, there's 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 many ways that you can cut a cigar. We talked about you're using your nails, biting it off with your mouth, um, that V cutter, the punch, the straight guillotine, you got the scissors, you've got um, punch, you've got um, using external elements, pointy elements to use as a punch, not necessarily a cigar punch like matches that I've done so many times before. Um, <laughs> Sometimes with the with the chisel, for example, some uh, you, you can pinch. The I was going to say that. Yeah, it's cool. Like I was going to say that I've done that so many times that I have nothing because I usually use my nails. I don't carry a cutter, um, and I've I've carried um, chisels every now and then. I'm like, or or any um, very pointy per, uh, pyramid or 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 figurado. What I usually do is I I bite off a little bit, so I kind of like massage it, just like open it up, and open up that airflow. And then I'll pinch one or two matches with something, you know, pointy on the sides. And it's just like the perfect draw. Not recommending people ruin their cigars like this. But if, if you learn how to do it, it's a great way to, to, to you know, poke a hole in there. You, we mentioned the chisel and there's one that comes to mind. And this is a really good use of the punch, actually. So, you know how the chisel and you can do this with a. Uh, with with uh tapered heads too you can take your punch and cut the and just punch through the flat part of the chisel and then across yep. now your uh <clears throat> your chisel it's we'll blow smoke on both sides and it just basically when you draw it launches smoke into your tongue and the the and the roof of your mouth and you get a pretty unique experience. It feels very different to do it that way instead of going straight. Yeah, it does. Out that way, it, it, it's it's very unique. So that I'll give the punch that one. You have to be yeah. careful. It's really easy to ruin. Uh, it's really easy to ruin a, a cigar with that technique if you don't properly yep. massage the cigar before. Yep, and I, I've got a, a couple things to say um, just to follow up with that. One is. 
the quality of the cutter. So there's cutters that are obviously going to perform better than others. Just like, you know, I'm going to give you some feedback on what you said on, on punch and, and how, you know, they're usually the most restricting to you um, in terms of airflow and, and, and performance when, with the cut itself. And, and I want to talk about there's cheap and there is just like very, um, very thin punch, uh, cigar punches. And then there's going to be like very high end ones. I mean, Cigar Bond just came out with a great product with a cigar stand that has a punch inside. And the punch, he was very, very, um, very obsessed, uh, very obsessive with how he, you know, built that punch inside that stand. And, and he did a great job because you, he gave it depth. He gave it depth. And aside from that, he gave it a very wide, um, you know, very wide circumference. So, you know, a Robusto is probably going to be, it's, it's probably going to uh, punch pretty much the whole circumference and it's going to give you a perfect draw um, or a great draw. Or it's going to give you a chance to get a better draw than just like a standard um, thin punch. So there are punches that are going to perform way better than any other, say, guillotine or just like a standard cut or a v cut obviously again we go back to depends on what cigar you're smoking and what the batola is um what that that field out or that shape on on the cigar's um head is so you know uh, other things that come to play is it is it a single cap is it a triple cap um you know single caps are a little more delicate because you get one sh one sh shot to to you know, to, to cut it on top. Like, I mean, if, if it's not that you get multiple chances, if it's triple cap, but it's more protected, if you mess up, you know, sometimes we'll grab a guillotine and then you cut it a little bit more towards the side and you don't get that like profound uh, cut yet. Not so thin, but at the same time, you're like affecting the cap on the edge and then it's not like leveled. And then we try to fix it. What you end up doing is removing that cap and, and, and that just usually peeled off the wrapper a little bit. And if the cigar is in, is in perfect condition, and depending on the wrapper, if it's, it's not a wrapper that has a lot of oil, it's probably going to, you know, peel off a little more than it should. But it's going to carry that, that, that wrapper peel to the side and it's going to just mess up your cigar. So you got to be careful. Um, another thing is how thin and how, how deep do you want to go with that cut? I mean, you know, I, so one of the, the biggest mistakes that I see is go of what you possibly can. Settle through the surface. You, it, you don't have to. Sometimes y'all see pictures with like dotted lines or where you should cut. Don't follow that. Just literally place it and try to cut as least amount of tobacco as you possibly can. And if you don't cut enough, you can always do it again. So a lot of times I'll just like barely touch it and I'll just have like a tiny cut and I'll just go again and do it again, go a little deeper, but it's, you can't really do that. Once you go deep, you're done. Yeah. You, you, you went too deep. You're, you're messing up the draw. Yeah. I, I, exactly. I'll get you there. You know what? You mentioned uh, the guillotine and how you can ruin a cut with it. There's also crushing the cigar to the point where it cracks. Yes. And uh, you don't get that with, uh, with the finger. You don't get that with the knife. And oddly enough, Benchmade, this is a Benchmade knife. I love Benchmade knives. If you can see the butterfly. I love Benchmade knives. And they uh, – started getting into cigar cutters and they went with this really hardcore steel called S90V, which basically stays sharp forever. If you're cutting cigars, you'll never have to sharpen this thing. As a matter of fact, most cigar cutters, once they're blunt, you throw them away and you buy a new one. This one's supposed to last forever. Here's one fatal flaw. It wasn't too good of a cutter because it would crush most cigars. Despite cutting, having a great edge, it was too thick uh, the, the, be the bevel itself was too thick and it was crushing the cigars once you got to the latter end of, of your of your cut. And that's bye bye. Uh, so it, and those sold for, re for a lot of money. So really, it, 
it's it's quite interesting that the whole guillotine you get this really fancy guillotine made by it and a proper cutlery and they get it wrong just because of the geometry because yep. geometry is what cuts uh geometry is what cuts and uh the steel says for how long basically it you also want stainless steel yeah and going back to 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 how a cutter makes you feel it's all about smoking cigars in general is all about the feel it's all about yes product is a substantial uh aspect on 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 the art of smoking itself but we're talking about how it makes you feel. So you'll have people who have a ritual. Um, everybody, I think everybody has a ritual. I mean, whether it's a simple thing, it's just like pulling it out of your pocket, biting it and lighting it. That may be your ritual. That's kind of my thing. Like make me like pulling up, pulling out a cigar when I hop in my car, biting it or, or, or just take like removing, just like cutting it with my nail and lighting up, like slowly lighting it up with my big lighter in my car is my ritual. And I love that. But a lot of people, are going to feel that carrying their high-end Ellie Blue or Prometheus or uh, SD DuPont lighters, uh, torch lighters and, and, and high-end cutters are, is, is part of that elegant, um, you know, rich pool that they have to do to enjoy their Opus X or whether it be like a, a you know, not such a high-end cigar, but it's part of the process, part of the ritual. So I think it's a beautiful thing. And, and it's, it's all about how it makes you feel like you can have a, 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 a really nice ritual without having to invest, you know, in, in a $200 scissor or a cord cutter or a $300 SD DuPont torch lighter. You could do that with a much more affordable structure. You got the, these Zanga lighters for like 10 bucks, which are unbelievable. And then you can get those, you can get those cheap guillotine cutters. Uh, there's, there's like the, there's the Psyker, uh, the 60 ring gauge ones that used to give, be given away in pro cigar. Those are one of my favorites and rarely do they, do they, yeah, rarely do they, uh, do they fail you? And, you know, if you can carry those and, and feel that that fulfills your ritual and that works for you, man, go for it. I mean, if I had to choose a cutter, like an, a cutting method that's not my nails, I'm going to probably going to have to go with, um, with scissors. I have these blacked out visal cutters that I usually use for prop. And I use sometimes when I'm at my desk at my home office, I'll have them there and I'll use them. I mean, I, I, I won't carry them around, but if I'm on my desk and I'm going to smoke, I'll just open the drawer, pull it up. I don't have to move. <laughs> it's just there. And just on my nice little ceramic ashtray, you know, I'll, I'll slowly cut it. Just make sure I, I get one or two cuts because I go really thin. And that just that cutting feel when I do that little snip, it feels good. And it feels like I'm, I'm giving it a little, a little more care and attention that I do when I just, you know, rip that cap or, or just, you know, dig in with my nails. So sometimes I do feel that it's it's a it's a nicer ritual um when i'm in my home office than than you know i wouldn't really bring it in my car which is my favorite place to smoke and i won't replace my nails in the car but if i'm on my home in my home office if i'm working i have my computer in front of me i'll pull up a cigar literally turn around grab it for my humidor it's right behind me grab a cigar i don't have to move but that feeling that i got with that those blacked out scissors is just really good so i think the ritual is a beautiful um component on cutting cigars and what you use you have it uh, well, there's something else i want to add we mentioned luxury here and you guys a lot of i get that a lot of our uh, our viewers are in the united states and uh Smoking cigars is a bit of a luxurious thing in the U.S. It, it's it's a fancy product for a fancy time for a lot of people. Uh, obviously, the more uh, enthusiast crowd is really into it and does it more casually. But here in the Dominican Republic, smoking cigars is so casual. It's not considered a luxury thing unless you're smoking in a luxury setting, a luxury cigar like the setting is what's luxurious, not the cigar itself here. And that's really exactly contrasting that 
uh, it, it's something I haven't really gotten to appreciate, uh, especially during Pro Cigar. A lot of people are just blown away by the gala, by the fancy stuff. But really, cigars are really casual here. Uh, and people cut their cigars with their nails. They light them with whatever they've got, matches, big lighters, whatever. And what's, what matters is that they're enjoying their experience. And th that really is it. Uh, there's a helicopter flying by, so I'm going to wait for it to buzz. I can't hear it. Well, I can't concentrate with it. <laughs> You're screaming, yeah, I can't concentrate. <laughs> well, <laughs> that'd be really cool, smoking a cigar in a helicopter. Oh, that'd be so great. That'd be so great. Imagine, imagine uh, the La Aurora crew when they flew in their uh, helicopter. I, used to, I mean, I lived behind my my home in Santiago was behind the La Aurora factory. They, well, the 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 Leon Jimenez factory. Your old, the, your old home? Well, my the San, the Dominican Republic home. So wait, really? It's it's right there because it's in a completely different street. No, it's you remember Leon Jimenez. The, that La Aurora factory is in is in Tamboril, but the Leon Jimenez, um, where they make the facilities, mark. exactly. That's when they had the the old factory is right behind my house, literally like two blocks down behind. Remember the, I, I'm the Juan Pablo Duarte, the, the, the street behind. So parallel streets. So I was thinking, but they divert at one point. So I was thinking that, that sure yeah. Has but when I'm in, but when I'm, I'm when when I'm in my backyard. I'll see like Guillermo's house is right next on the other side. It's behind Guillermo's house, like two blocks down on the on a parallel main street. So the helicopter is like literally it, it flies over my house and it takes like five seconds to get to the to the facility. So it's right there. Well, I, I used to think all the time when it was flying by, I'm like, they're probably smoking cigars in there. It's oh, man, a feeling. as a matter of fact, uh, they're not really into uh, the helicopter thing anymore because of the separation from Grupo El Unimed. So La Aurora doesn't belong to the corporate group anymore. Guillermo Leon yeah. bought it. Actually, a, a uh, I mean, you got to give it to him. He put his passion into it. So he bought the company from his own family just to yep. uh, keep the passion alive. Got to give it to him. And... Uh, and uh, a lot of the big corporate stuff stopped happening, like those daily trips to the capital by helicopter, which uh, my dad was talking to me about. He was talking to me about it the other day, saying you were about five years off, off from taking a weekly helicopter ride to the capital. I was like, I don't yeah. think, but at the same time, that would have been cool because I don't like the capital that much. I don't like Santo Domingo. It's it's Neither especially during the week. It's too crowded, too much traffic. It's uh, I, I like uh, this semi-suburban lifestyle we have in this small city. Santiago, you can say Santiago, small city, semi-suburban. Uh, yep. Where I live, and it's just—I I guess you could say it's kind of like the best of both worlds, but not the whole thing. Yeah, agreed. So, and I really like it. Uh, so, which. Birmingham, Alabama is, is what comes to mind. I was there earlier this year, which is where I bought this knife. And it was talking about cigars that got me a discount on this knife at a really nice place called Mark's Outdoors. The guys there, they're, uh, they're, they love their cigars. They, they uh, were chatting about them. I told them I came from the Dominican Republic. I was there to do some, some training, um, some wilderness training. And uh, we had a great chat. And uh, when I said, oh, this is what I want to buy, they said, hey, you're getting a nice discount just for entertaining us for a few minutes. And uh, yeah, whenever I get back to Birmingham, which I will, uh, I'm definitely uh, <laughs> I'm going to drop a few cigars over uh, at Mark's Outdoors because those guys are great. Shout out Mark's Outdoors. Lovely. I should have been uh, rocking their shirt because they gave me a shirt too. That was, that was awesome. It was possibly one of the coolest experiences as a solo traveler is what most people would call our country because people, I get, I get, I guess that in Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, those places, they, they don't get a lot of tourists. Uh, they get a handful, right? But they don't get a lot. Yeah. 
like uh, like other I, I think i'm gonna rephrase that they don't get a lot of international tourists i mean right. they probably get a lot yeah exactly that's what you meant that's a, that's exactly what i was going for they don't get like the orlando new york la kind of tourism uh and i guess just seeing someone from outside stopping in their town was flattering uh, in a good way and yeah uh, especially if you're from a from the dominican republic so yeah and share a common interest i, I i'm i'm an outdoorsman and uh they're cigar aficionados and, and we intersected in those two hobbies uh well obviously i'm into cigars i'm not sure if it's obvious uh but i i guess it I, is i got that idea yeah Big so picture. Como, like like we say in Spanish, se cae de la mata. It's ripe fruit, easy picking from the tree. I'm yep. a bit into cigars. They're a bit into the outdoors because they were working at a, at a at an outdoorsman's shop. But man, it just connect with a lot of people over cigars. And uh, little did they know they were actually selling me a cigar cutter. Little did they know. So, what about? We talk about how cutting a cigar is Hold part on. of reality, but let, let's go back to those old corny cigar grips. <laughs> those are good. <laughs> uh, you're fancy, you're professorial, you're imposing. God, those are good. They're corny as hell, uh, but they, they're they're somewhat based in reality because it is. They, body- they are. They are. I used to I used to see them be like that. That makes so much sense. It's goofy, but it's true uh because so cause right holding now, your cigar what does that say about you so right now i'm casual i'm conversational so i'm doing my hands do the talking and my cigar is just accenting that but if i were to be imposing yep. professorial i'd lean my hand over on the table if i'm listening carefully this is like an attentive stance or let's say i'm attentive but also receptive i'll show you the inside of my hand but at the same time i'm guarding my body a little bit so it's like Okay, I'm showing you a little bit of me, but not all of it, except now. I'm really open in conversation, dude. Yep. And it's just what I'm doing with my hands. It's body language mixed with cigar smoking. But it's interesting how, you, how you're assertive of those poses because you're aware of what you're doing and you've been doing it for a while. But how about those individuals that say – you know, the, the, the upcoming enthusiast, the, 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 the quote unquote beginner, right. That, that does this unconsciously. I, th- I think it's really interesting to see when people are, instead of holding your, their cigars like this, for example, I think this is a very rookie, rookie pose to, you know, something like this and, and have, you know, let's call them the noobs or the beginnings, just holding the cigar very, um, very elegantly but it's it's more of like how they're taking care and how they so, so i see like there's a lot of potential in this guy you know you've got this this new beginner that hasn't really dug too much into the 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 educational aspect of cigar and hasn't really learned a lot it's just more doing it out of pure you know um sorry out of what intuition is the word yeah intuition but it's more of like they're, they're doing they're doing they're smoking just because they're into it um they're, they're they like the, the the fact that you know they can enjoy a cigar even though they're not reading the magazines or following the blogs or listening to the ratings they're just you know whether it be because they got an advice from somebody else or they just picking up random cigars to learn about them and then you'll randomly see a noob or a beginner just holding a cigar like this, just quite elegantly. And, you know, every now and then you'll get a guy who's puff and, 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 and retro. And I'm like, Oh, you get it. Like you, you, you actually get this and, and you get the fact that this is something that an artisanal product that goes through, you know, hundreds of hands to, to make, and you got to take care of it. It's, you know, it's not like, it's like those, it's like when you hold a beer like this versus when you hold a beer like this and you're drinking it like this. Usually people that drink craft beer are, know where to grab the beer to not warm it up or, you know, kind of like respect the drink as opposed to like you grab like a Bud Light or, or, or a, like a Budweiser or whatever. You're, you hold just, it like this because it's, it's, it's just beer. It's just alcohol. You just want to get drunk. But, you know, people that usually – yeah, that drink 
craft beer or more refined beers or let's I'm I just picked up on the beer example just are more cautious even though they may not be you know beer advocates or or aficionados or what have you they kind of intuitively that was perfectly phrased by you to intuitively hold the beer in a way and they didn't even have an education course on you know where you should grab it how you should grab it you don't want to warm up the beer um or you know you don't want to get it too foamy when you pour it you got to just the perfect amount of just so you can enjoy it and i think it's the same way with a cigar when you're holding a cigar a certain way it speaks on how you feel about the product and that's my point how you feel about the product what regardless of you understanding you know the craft or understanding the 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 extreme delicate delicate uh, you know circumstance that you're in when you're holding a cigar when you're holding a cigar like this for example this is you paying your respect to a delicate artisanal product that takes a lot of work and a lot of um just a lot of care and attention to make and for to, to, to enable you to, to hold it and smoke it so you know i, I think it's it speaks uh volumes on, on, on your character and, and your approach to cigar, how you hold them. Well, it, it's, it's interesting how you mentioned that they're not thinking about it because that matters. Let, let, let's just shift to another paradigm. Artists. Artists yep. don't often think too much about what they're doing. Obviously, they're deliberate, but they're more intuitive, right? Yes. So they use their intuition to create whatever they're making. And it's not until the philosophers come to interpret it that we give it a name. So really, I'm, I'm, I'm butchering what I'm saying. I'm destroying it now. But let's say Cardi B, she's onto something, right? She's using to, her intuition to tell the world something. I've left the conversation. <laughs> let's, let's rewind. Just please go with another example. It's, it, that's crushing me. All right. So- I, I just, uh, I, I'm, Am I having a heart attack? Or is it just like heartburn right now? All right, Cardi B was a horrible example, but I it was, yes. I was just gonna drive the point home on one direction. Now I'm gonna go through the other. Jazz, right? If you've ever been okay. to a jazz performance, hardly ever it's by design. Correct. It, it's so about the feeling, whatever they're sensing, whatever they're. they're it's almost yes. like it's not the script, right? So it's only after we've experienced it that we can say something about it. And exactly. That's, the, that's what art is. And philosophy is what you say about that art. And, uh, well, we're, here we are philosophizing about the art that every single cigar smoker makes. But, again, that, that, that builds up to a beautiful case that relates to what we were saying about holding a cigar intuitively, but then holding it with intention because you already know. So that's about, you know, we, you mentioned the, the, the great example. So art, you take artists like Pollock, right? Pollock intuitively dev- like grew or, 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 or heightened that drip painting uh, or technology, like technique. And that became his way of, of, of developing that, that unique artwork. And then he mastered that craft when he, he developed that, that, that dripping um, um, technique. Then he thought about it when he learned, when he did that intuitively and he learned and he developed that craft, he then intentionally um, perfected that way. So just like Damien Hurst, right? So you'll have a Hearst um, dot, dotted um, painting sell for like $30 million, right? Probably what he did initially was intuitively – you know draw a bunch of dots right next to each other and it came out so good that the visual the the, like the visual um i want to say the visual satisfaction of seeing that contrast between different dotted colors gave him that that expertise on drawing drawing dots so now he will approach and develop his craft on how he intuitively got there from you know drawing different dots and, and and what came out with something so beautiful to the eye and so satisfying to, 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 to that, to the visual that he said, all right, 
what if I take this to another level and he'll go into a room, a massive room and just draw different dots and a whole across the room and just, just ever so slightly gradually change the color from one dot to another. And then what you see is just a sea of dots that transition barely from one another in, in, in distinctive colors. And that gives you such a unique satisfaction to the eye that he developed that craft based on intuition. And, you know, he didn't come in here and say, I'm just going to draw dots. No. And let's see how it works out. His yeah. intuition told him, let's draw dots, different colors and see what patterns come out. And it came out great. It's just like beginners holding cigars this way. They're respecting how, you know, the, the craft of cigars should, 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 should be represented in their hands should be, should be, um, should be approached. And then they learn, all right, th this, it, it, it justifies how I'm holding this. And there's a reason behind it. Because what you know feeds your intuition and you use that to explore some more. Cause, cause yep. artist, when an artist stops sort of exploring, I guess you could say, when artists what well, they'll just do it. Get writer's block, get painter's block and just stop, just stop being themselves whenever they have nothing else to explore they just it's almost like they stop existing a writer is another great example i really doubt that there's 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 ever been a writer that has you know methodically structured so, like what they were going to write before they got good at it i mean i'm pretty sure that after they got good writing things sporadically and intuitively they could say, all right, I want to write about this. And they've already built a structure on how they understood that writing was going to be. But before that, I, I don't think there's ever been, you know, those big JK Rowling's the, 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 in a different genre. Let's go talk about the, the Daniel Epstein's or the Malcolm Gladwell's of the world. I doubt that they, you know, pragmatically and methodically designed what they were going to write about before they even started writing in the beginning. Yeah. Let's it's, it's about who got there first. Right. So, the reason we have writing skills that we can educate ourselves on is because those writers got there first and we're imitating them in a way. They, yep. they, they've intuitively figured out how to structure stories, how to tell them, how to incorporate plot twists, how to develop characters, how to describe the world in the pages that you're reading or, or even the screen that you're reading on or the audio book you're listening to. That's not the point. The point is that the reason we study these skills and we can master them after it's is is purely because someone's already done it by intuition first. Yep. Yep. That's, that's the whole thing behind cigar smoking that you get to intuitively master that art because cigar smoking is an art. Now that we've gotten all into this, any skill is an art and smoking a cigar is easy, but it's also a skill. You can correct ruin what you're doing. It's a skill. It's an easy skill to master, yes, but it's still just a like cutting a cigar. Yeah, and we're back at square one, which is perfect to put a ribbon on it. Absolutely, let's put a ribbon on this. A ribbon or a bow? I, I, I'm getting my languages twirled up because uh, you know I'm a lightweight and cigar is getting my head. Well, a ribbon transforms into a bow, so we can do both. We can use a ribbon to tie a bow. Exactly. Bam. That was it. That was episode six. That is 100% one week after episode five was shot. 100%. 100%. Wearing the same clothes. Um, I showered. Miguel didn't. Uh, he's smoking the same cigar. I'm smoking a different one. So that kind of gives you an idea. Um, you know, who showered, who didn't. <laughs> but uh, just to cap this off, thank you, everybody, for listening. Be sure to subscribe. Follow, share this with your friends and keep smoking some good stuff and let us know what you want to hear. Yeah. All right. Let's know how you cut your cigars down in the comments below, gents and ladies. And we'll see you guys in the next episode. Well, and the content in between. Later. Peace.
Hey guys, it's Alex, and if you enjoyed this episode or any other one from the podcast, check out our website, mycigarpack.com and cigaryard.com, where we provide the most dynamic cigar subscription service in the market by collecting the world's best cigars and delivering them to your door, and a enhanced online shopping experience when buying your cigars or learning from the culture. Subscribe to this channel, share it with your friends and family, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can contact us through our websites. Check it out, mycigarpack.com and cigaryard.com, our YouTube channel, the podcast. It's all an ecosystem. See you soon.